We are live. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this special committee of the whole. And today we're dealing with a, a very special matter that's extremely important in our role as a city council. And that, of course, has to do with uh, the management of our water system and ensuring safe water for um, all of our residents. And so tonight, we're undergoing the standard of care training that's uh, mandated by the uh, regulatory and statutory authorities. And it's to assist us in uh, our role as uh, overseeing the drinking water quality management system. So it's, uh, it's a very important evening and very educational for those who haven't gone through it before. And I'll now call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to take the roll call unless it's already been taken. Through the chair, roll call has already been taken. I see that Councillor Carpenter has joined the meeting. Uh, his camera's still not on, so I'm assuming that he's here. Okay, so I'll ask, does anybody have a declaration of pecuniary interest they need to make on any of the items appearing on tonight's agenda? Not seeing any raised hands. So we have pre three presentations on tonight's agenda. And of course, section 15.6.3 of our procedural bylaw provides for a time limit of 10 minutes for presentation, inclusive questions for members. If nobody objects, since this is a training session, I don't think we really want to limit uh, the trainers to 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna waive that rule tonight. And if anybody objects, then we'll put a motion on the floor. Yes, Councilor McCurry. Mayor, I think it'd be better if we do introduce a motion to waive the rules. Well, so you're formally objecting, all right? So I need a motion then to, uh, to extend the time period for the presentations. And I would suggest that we extend the time period for each presentation to, I suspect 20 minutes would probably do it for each. Yeah. So, so moved. all right, so you've moved that. It's seconded by Councillor Sullivan. Any discussion about that? And I think it does require a two thirds vote. So Councillor McCurry. Mayor, I think it's important that it's, it's important that we that we allow the time necessary, but it's also important that we be seen to follow our own rules, which I think really should require a move or second or vote. Okay. Yes, you, you're always very consistent on that, Councilor McCurry, and it's appreciated. So any further discussion? Saying none, uh, we'll take the vote. Yes. Mine's a yes. Councillor Sless, uh, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Yes. And Councillor Hunt. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't realize we were on eScribe for tonight. Through the chair, the motion to waive the rules carries unanimously with the required two thirds on a recorder vote of 10 to zero members of council voting in favor are as follows, Mayor Davis, Councillors Socoli, Sullivan, Caputo, Sless, McCreary, Hunt, Carpenter, Samuel, and Van Tilborg. All right, so to begin tonight's um, meeting, then I'll ask that uh, Andy Hans, our, Hans, our deputy CAO, if he can provide us an introduction, please. And I see Andy, you're coming in uh, virtually. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Davis, members of council. Um, very important item today uh, in front of you is to comply with our standard care, standard of care for drinking water. Um, the team is there in front of you in chambers and they'll carry on the presentation. I'd just like to provide a, a brief introduction um, to what you'll be hearing today. Next slide. Uh, just the agenda for today. Um, aside from the introduction right now, uh, you will hear from Selvi Kangara, Director of Environmental Services on the Drinking Water Program Overview. Um, and then afterwards, uh, Duane Ayers will provide the Water Treatment Distribution System Overview. Um, Teresa McLennan from the Canadian Environmental Law Association will also provide a little bit more detail in regards to the Safe Drinking Water Act and the standard of care. So I'll, I'll be very high level, but I'll leave all the details to Teresa. And once we've concluded with the presentations, there will be a tour uh, of our water treatment plant uh, following uh, this, this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of why we're here and the importance of, of us being here today and providing you with this information. Um, the center of care and, and also while well, the Safe Drinking Act, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act uh, from 2002 
Section 19 discusses the standard of care, and that is legislation that was enacted in 2012, um, which expressly extends the legal responsibility to people with decision-making authority over municipal drinking water systems. Uh, so this requires that they, um, that we, uh, they exercise a level of care, diligence and skill with regard to our municipal drinking water system that a reasonably prudent person would be expected to exercise in a similar situation. It's also expected that they exercise this due diligence honestly, competently and with integrity. So the standard of care legislation applies to municipal councils and management, but does not apply directly to certified drinking water operators. So the main goal is to remind municipal councils of their responsibilities for providing safe drinking water and to highlight the importance of safe drinking water from a public health and economic perspective. So I'll just leave, uh, before I leave this slide, just a quote from the from Justice Dennis O'Connor in, in the report of the Walkerton inquiry, um, where um, Dr. Snow uh, was uh, quoted uh, from his discovery in 1954 that drinking water could kill people by transmitting disease. That, that developed world has come a long way towards eliminating the transmission of waterborne disease. The Walkerton experience warns that they may have become victims of our own success, taking for granted our drinking water safety. The keynote in the future should be vigilance. We should never be complacent about drinking water. So I'll leave that thought uh, today with you and the importance that we have uh, to keep our drinking water safe as I pass it on to Selvi Congera to discuss the vision and further uh, this presentation. Thank you. Um, good okay. evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Sylvie Congera. I'm the Director of Environmental Services, so I'll continue on the presentation. Um, so um, here, this is the vision for the drinking water program, and it talks about providing safe and high quality drinking water to residents and businesses in adequate quantities in an economically viable, reliable, and environmentally responsible manner while meeting regulatory requirements and providing superior customer service. Um, there are a lot of things here, but the main thing of, or the utmost important one is the safety of the drinking water. And you're going to hear today a lot of uh, repeat of the same kind of the message about safety of the drinking water. Sorry. Um, so in terms of services, uh, for drinking water service, we provide to residents and businesses. And um, as you know, the water is also provided for firefighting. And we have a bulk water station where um, con contractors could use the water for construction purposes or irrigation purpose and so on. And the city also supplies water to Canesville in Brand County. Um, the Tudla water system, now the city uh, brought in the Tudla water system in 2017, and uh, Brand County um, is supplying the water there. They own and supply and maintain um, under an agreement with the city, and the Mount Pleasant system is a well water system, and currently they're servicing around uh, 325 city customers. And the city is, um, there is a capital budget approved um, for design and construction of the piping system to connect the Mount Pleasant system or actually Tudla Heights area distribution system to city system by December 31st, 2025. Um, so next, moving on to infrastructure. Um, the city has one water treatment plant and uh, pumping stations and reservoirs and elevated tanks and uh, pipe network underground. I won't go into the details. Um, uh, the, our presenters today will go and present uh, more details on these. Um, the asset management plan talks about value of the assets. It's $697 million. That's the plant and the pumping stations and the pipe network, everything together. And I know it's not a small chunk. Um, 
the assets are maintained and uh, the condition is rated as good in the asset management plan. And um, the maintenance is done through daily maintenance and also through 10-year capital program where we replace um, our existing assets based on the condition assessment and how they are performing. Um, and then uh, also the capital program provides um, new infrastructure for growth purposes. I'll explain uh, the growth uh, infrastructure. Before that, I just want to bring up about advanced meter systems. Um, the city is very excited about moving from our current water meter program to advanced meter programs. This is uh, kind of the smart meter, uh, kind of similar to hydro installed in 2010. So the city will be moving to smart water meter systems uh, for our water too. That'll happen from 2023 to 2026 to roll out to the whole city. So when it comes to um, growth infrastructure, the 2020 master servicing plan lays out how to service or provide water to the new boundary lands, both up north and also in the Tula area. And the infrastructure services until 2051, once it is built. Um, there are 42 projects worth of 189.7 million. Um, it's almost adding 25% more um, value to our assets, that amount of infrastructure. And majority of these assets are going to be built in the first 10 years. Um, any um, like a elevated tanks, uh, there it is proposed to add an elevated tank north of Powerline Road on King George Road. So any main tanks or uh, reservoirs or piping uh, transmission pipes, the city will build and the developers will build the local um, pipes in the subdivisions. Um, the city also has the 2022 financial plan. Council approved the funding strategy uh, to service the growth. Um, and um, Bill 23, uh, again, this probably you hear again and again from staff, we don't know the full impact of Bill uh, 23 uh, because development charges fund uh, the growth portion of the infrastructure. So if Bill 23 doesn't cover it, that means the rate has to cover. Uh, so we'll get into that once we give get more details on that. Um, so continue on with the funding, um, the water rate funds the water program, both the operating and capital portion of the uh, expenses, and there are no tax um, funded program for water. And um, the rates are approved in principle once every five years. And you see on the side in there, the figure showing 2022 to 2023 rate structure. So the rate structure was approved in principle by council. So why is this approval in principle happens? It gives an opportunity for um, the city businesses a heads up on what kind of a rate structure they're looking at moving forward. And that way they could do their financial planning. And very similar, uh, even for the city to plan our future capital program, we can project what kind of revenue we're going to get. Um, so in the 2022 financial plan that was approved by council, uh, there's no increase of the fixed charges, which was uh, which is constant for the next decade. And also the increase to um, water rate has been kept around 2.5% since 2019. And if you see from 2022 to 2032, it's on average around 2.2%. The approved budget, this just gives a, a general idea about the size of the water program. Um, the revenue, this includes both the water rate revenue and we also have some um, service charges, uh, revenue from service charge. So all that together, around 28.4 million is the revenue and our expense is around 19.6 million. That includes the two and a half million debt payment we make. Um, that's for the infrastructure upgrades we did to the water plant in 2012. Um, 
And uh, a roughly 8.8 .8 million or 30% of the revenue goes in the reserve, mainly to fund the capital program. And you can kind of imagine, given that we have 697 million worth of asset to maintain, it requires a lot of investment. And again, the investment is ba made based on the condition and performance of the asset. And the capital projects are funded from the rate revenue and uh, growth projects are funded from the development charges and uh, and debt financing, depending on the nature of the project and uh, some grant funding. Uh, there are 53 staff in total for water that uh, kind of includes administration, uh, producing water treatment, um, uh, distribution system maintenance, compliance staff, uh, capital program, and commenting on the development application. So we are involved from the very start to end of the um, any kind of a development just to make sure when it comes to water, we have to be proactive. Uh, so the staff are very dedicated and capable, committed staff, and we're very proud of our staff. So this is kind of my last slide, um, uh, safety of the drinking water. Um, there are many checks and balances to ensure the safety of the drinking water, I'm just um, I'm just I'm just listing here a few things. You are going to hear more about these from our next presenters. Um, so the first one talks about uh, multiple barriers from contaminants. That's from all the way from the source water to all the way to the tap water where uh, our residents consume. There are many steps in the way to make sure the water is safe. Um, so when it comes to source, that is uh, source protection. So there is a clean water under Clean Water Act. We are required to prepare source protection plan and the source protection plan is uh, implemented. Um, the, the measures of the plan are included in the official plan and uh, zoning bylaw. And uh, we work with the Grand River Conservation Authority uh, to make sure the source protection information or requirements are implemented. So then moving on from source to treatment, we do have a sophisticated treatment plant. It's uh, classified as class four. Class four is the highest classification. What that means is we have a state of the art plant. We take water from the Grand River and treat it, and it requires a sophisticated plant uh, just because of the nature of the use upstream. And um, our plant is operated 24-7, uh, 365 days. There is somebody physically there monitoring the operations. And we also have um, distribution staff, and they're on call for after hours. Make sure there is 24-7, 365 staff are available and respond to emergency, uh, given the essential nature of the drinking water uh, that we supply. And um, and and. Uh, who is operating these the treatment plants? Our operators um, are uh, certified, trained, and the certification is issued by the ministry. And um, because our plant is class four, the operators also have to have highest level of class four certification. And that takes years of operating experience and a lot of uh, courses and education they have to go through um, to get to that level of expertise to operate and maintain the plant. Um, we also have quality management system. You've heard about ISO 9000, 14000. Um, so very kind of similar, but this is a quality management system created just for drinking water by province of Ontario after Walkerton. It has kind of similar principles uh, of a quality management system. So that system has to be maintained. And to do that, we have to go through internal audit every year. And we also have to go through external audit. This is an agency hired by the ministry audits our facility once every three years. And um, so 
um, when it comes to, uh, that's why I say there are many checks and balances in here. And ministry also inspects our facility every year and they give us their compliance score uh, depending on various uh, categories, how we perform. So we are very proud to say that we have been maintaining 100% scores since uh, 2018. And in the 2022 inspection, we got the 100% compliance score. And um, and also to say that the drinking water system must be licensed. Uh, province issues the license, and to maintain a license, there are requirements. And you're going to hear more about that from our speakers, so I won't go into the details there. And, and every step of the way in the treatment process, the water is tested. And the testing is done using a third-party lab. Our finished water, um, a certified third-party lab has to do those tests. Again, province inspects them, make sure their certification means they have to meet certain level of standard. And also um, Brand County Health Unit, I know health unit staff are uh, here. Um, uh, our Medical Officer of Health provides um, oversight of the system. So when it comes to uh, making a call on the drinking water quality, our health unit, you know, we work hand in hand with them and they're very supportive of us and uh, they look at what's happened and then issue whether uh, it, it warrants a boil water advisory or any kind of a, a, a advisory that is needed. And um, water emergency plan, again, um, uh, the, C the water emergency plan covers small emergencies like affecting a couple of homes to a street, to a whole area, to the whole city. Uh, various scenarios are covered and, uh, and a thank you goes to our staff, Chris Letzi, our emergency coordinator. We worked uh, with the Chris to put together our water emergency plan. Um, so last but not least, um, a good working environment and a staff culture. Um, it is essential no matter how you know how many checks and balances you have in place. Uh, proactive and vigilance nature um, is required when it comes to safety of the drinking water. Again, I can't uh, say enough about our staff who provide um, a committed uh, service in terms of providing safe drinking water. So that's the uh, end of my presentation. Anybody have any questions for Selby? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Selby. So we have uh, next, I believe it's going to be Dwayne and, uh, and Jim. Jim Young. So Dwayne, lead it off for us. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Uh, welcome, Mr. Mayor and members of council uh, to the standard of care presentation um, for the City of Brantford Drinking Water System. Um, I'll be presenting you uh, an overview of water operations, uh, which includes the water treatment plant. Um, Jim Young will be uh, discussing water distribution, and I will also be doing water compliance. So the first slide is the, uh, the Homedale Water Treatment Plant. Um, as Selvi mentioned, um, it was uh, redone in 2012 and it's been online, uh, which a lot of people would uh, be amazed at already over 10 years. So it's kind of not new anymore, but it still is new. Um, just a history of the water treatment in Brantford. Um, first treatment plant was built in 1886. Uh, 1930, a new plant was built, which was 22 megaliters a day. Um, 1945, we were the first uh, city in Canada to dose fluoride into the water. Um, 1952, additional filters were added to the old plant. Um, in 1999, the new build kind of started to take shape uh, when the low lift and active flow were added. Um, 2004, the residual management facility was um, built. And then in 2012, uh, ozone, UV filters, high lift um, were part of the new plant. Um, reservoirs and pumping stations added in the 50s, uh, 1993 and 2004. So water treatment and water distribution, um, 
Homedale is a class four plant. As Selby said, uh, capacity is uh, 100 megaliters, which is 100,000 cubic meters a day. Um, source is the Grand River via the Homedale Canal, 24-7 uh, coverage, uh, fully automated um, via SCADA. Uh, the entire process is backed up by backup generators um, in case we use uh, lose um, power from the utility. And again, it's a multi-barrier approach uh, that was implemented with the plant. Um, water distribution is class three, uh, three pumping stations and reservoirs in the city one booster pumping station, uh, two elevated storage tanks, soon to be a new one added, and 507.7 kilometers of water mains. And Jim will speak a little more of that later. So the start of the process um, is Wilkes Dam and the Headgates. Um, the city draws the water from the Grand River. Uh, it enters the Four Bay, which is the picture on the right. Um, and is controlled remotely uh, by the water treatment plant operators with three head gate valves. Um, the barrels that are on the left direct uh, large debris away from the four bay. And um, we're talking large trees, uh, usually um, during the flood, it, it was very good to have those there. Um, typically one of the valves is open about 15 to 20% to keep the Homedale Canal um, level consistent and um, this year we did uh, dredge the four bay to provide us more room and capacity um, for the front of the head gates. So the next slide is the Homedale Canal uh, which we draw 100% of our water from. Uh, it's 1.5 kilometers long, contains about 49 megaliters of water. Um, the canal can be isolated with the um, head gates um, in case of upstream spills, which uh, I know you receive emails when we have to do that. And uh, we do maintain the canal by operating our mini generator, which uh, in the summertime we turn it on to pull, you know, a high rate of water through it to, to keep the weeds down, to keep it clean, to make sure the water is good to process. So the low lift pumping station, uh, it delivers water from the canal to uh, start our treatment process in the active flow. Um, it consists of coarse bar screens that you know, prevent large debris from getting into the wet wells. Um, and it also has a fine traveling screen, which removes smaller particles, sticks. Um, that was rebuilt last year. And uh, it consists of four vertical turbine pumps that can pump 520 liters a second of water to our plant. So our active flow, um, it performs coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation of the raw water. Um, and what does that mean? So the goal of coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation is to remove particles from the raw water. Um, and that's accomplished by adding chemicals and um, micro sand at specific dosages uh, and allowing it to mix thoroughly and then have it uh, settle. Um, at the back of this active flow are, are lamella plates. And as the water flows up through them to go further down the process, those plates grab the particles and drop them. So they settle out. So next to the process is ozone. Um, ozone is a reaction of liquid oxygen and electricity. Uh, ozone is a strong oxidant and is used primarily for taste and odor control for the city. Um, improves water safety by breaking down man-made uh, organic contaminants such as pesticides and herbicides. Uh, in simple terms, it's uh, ozone oxidizes organic matter within the water and makes the water better. Uh, ozone is produced on site. We do have a liquid oxygen tank on site and there are numerous safeguards in place uh, if there was an, an event of a leak. So filtration, um, water from the ozone contact chambers flows into uh, eight deep bed biological filters, which are made up of anthracite and sand. Um, the total filtration area of one is 594 um, square meters. 
1,600 millimeters anthracite and 400 millimeters of sand and under drains are at the bottom. Um, the filters will run for around 90 to 100 hours before having to be backwashed. Um, automatic shutdowns are in place for these filters uh, to ensure the filtered water um, that does not meet um, the required targets uh, will shut down the treatment process. And just to know that we are currently in a partnership with uh, for safe water with AWWA, and uh, we're focusing on optimization methods for the processes to identify and improve the water quality, reliability, um, and just to make our system better and optimize it better. So next in the process is ultraviolet or UV disinfection. Um, this is part of the multi-barrier approach and UV is used an additional layer of disinfection. Um, UV is extremely effective in inactivating pathogens and microorganisms. Um, a fourth train or reactor is getting added, uh, hopefully the end of this year, and that will make our entire proce process uh, symmetrical which will help again with um, producing high quality water. So disinfection, um, we use gases, chlorine and um, ammonia gas. So the chlorine gas is fed by chlorinators, which is added in uh, control amounts in the chlorine contact chambers at the plant. Uh, the objective is to have enough contact time to allow the chlorine to disinfect the water and as the water travels through the contact chambers. Um, the secondary disinfection is gaseous ammonia, and uh, it is fed from ammoniators into the water where it readily reacts with the chlorine and uh, forms chloramines. And uh, this is required to produce more stable chlorine residual um, throughout the distribution system. So fluoridation, um, we, as we said, it was, we were the first in Canada to start adding fluoride. Um, it is mandated by the health unit in controlled amounts. Um, the fluoride system does have numerous safeguards in place to prevent overdosing um, and due to the nature of the chemical, uh, it was designed to, to limit staff um, interaction with it. So high lift pumping, um, after the water leaves the treatment plant and it has uh, been fully disinfected and is potable, the water goes to a reservoir on site that uh, holds up to 18 megaliters or 18 million liters of potable water. Um, the high lift pumping station located on site um, pumps the treated water to the distribution city or distribution system for the city of Brantford. Uh, includes four pumps and one backup diesel pump. Um, a capital project is underway uh, to bring um, pumps five and six back online uh, to be used again. And pressures and flows are all monitored uh, via SCADA by the water treatment plant operators. So the residual management process. Um, so all the, all the residue from the filter backwashes and the active flow go to the RMF uh, equalization tank and then it gets pumps, pumped and settled into what we call thickeners. And these thickeners turn into a sludge, which then gets transferred to another holding tank. Um, once a sludge tank reaches a predetermined level, uh, sludge gets distributed to belt presses where the sludge gets dewatered and augered into bins. And once the bins are full, uh, it gets transferred to landfill. Um, and both the thickening and dewatering processes use polymers to help with the thickening and settling. So supervisory control and data acquisition. So SCADA is which I mentioned before. Um, SCADA provides all the control of the treatment processes. Uh, SCADA is an information conduit for operations staff. Um, and they use it to determine the most effective way to treat and distribute safe drinking water. Um, the system directly interacts with valves, pumps, motors, um, through human machine interface, which is HMI software. Uh, the screenshot is of the active flow, which is what I discussed earlier. Um, and the SCADA system monitors, gathers, and processes and records real-time data, which is crucial 
for when we have our ministry inspections because uh, they that's what they go through. They they go through our data like with a fine tooth comb. So uh, population and reservoirs. Um, City is divided into three pressure zones. Well, four, I guess. Um, pressure zone one is supplied by the water plant and has one booster station on Albion Street, um, which feeds into pressure zone two, three. And it has one elevated tank, which is Shellers Lane. Um, pressure zone two, three has King George elevated tank, a Park Road Reservoir and Tollgate Reservoir. And pressure zone four has one reservoir, which is the Northwest Reservoir. And um, again, each station is controlled remotely by the water treatment operator through SCADA. So city has two elevated tanks. Uh, Sheltered Lane is a six megaliter, megaliter tank and is our newest tank. And there's the King George tank that is on King George Road and future tank development for the North Development Lands for PD-23 in a few years. So quickly, um, so water distribution system just for customer water quality inquiries. Um, our compliance department usually gets approximately 50 calls a year mm -hmm. from customers. Um, most of them can be dealt with quickly and uh, are there are usually internal issues like hot water heaters um, or just information requests and our compliance staff will go to site if it is needed. Um, for the distribution system, Jim Young, manager of distribution and collection is going to say a few words on it. Jim. Thank you, Dwayne, through you mayor to council. The uh, water distribution system is made up of 507 kilometers of pipe uh, which off of that 507 kilometers, there's 30, over 32,000 water services going to residential homes, uh, commercial buildings, or industrial buildings. Um, with that, there is uh, 9, 000, over 9,400 valves in the system with uh, 2,781 fire hydrants. The water distribution um, department also looks after all the main breaks and service leaks. In 2022, there was 20 main breaks we had throughout the city, along with 41 uh, water service leaks. The biggest thing the water distribution department looks after is customer service calls um, from customers and from any owners of businesses or uh, contractors. Um, this includes water off and on calls, inspections for new water services, checking for leaks, low pressure, and a lot more. In 2022, the department received um, 3,943 calls um, for our staff to look into. Now that our department is on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, that inc and including holidays, this works out to roughly being 11 calls per day that we're dealing with the public or helping them out uh, with. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. So next slide uh, is water compliance. So water quality quality sampling. Um, in 2022, compliance took over 1,800 water samples throughout the city for uh, regulatory purposes, construction, and new development projects. Um, the programs for, for compliance, um, there's lead service reduction, which uh, provides lead financial incentives for anybody with lead services. Uh, and that's available through the program to assist residents the cost of lead replacement. Um, lead filters are available in lead educational flyers and programs um, are also available. Uh, source water protection. Um, this is vital for the protection of the city's source water. Uh, there's three zones, IPZ1, IPZ2, and IPZ3 zones with IPZ1 being the most critical. Um, we also do salt management plans, risk management plan reviews, um, review of planning and building applications, and also educational programs. Um, water compliance also does the backflow program. Um, fines of up to $1,000 can be enforced for violators of the city's backflow prevention bylaw. 
um, which was uh, approved in June of 2018. Um, backflow preventers ensure wastewater and non-potable water can't enter the city's water distribution system. And again, brochures are sent and delivered uh, to property owners to educate them. And all of this is on uh, the city websites, if you're interested. So our successes, um, THMs are formed um, by the reaction of chlorine and organics in the water. Um, as you can see, the, the MAC for this is 100 um, parts per billion, which is 100 uh, micrograms per liter. Um, we are well below that. Um, the values are well below the MAC. Um, and we've been that way for numerous years. And this has all been because since the upgrade uh, in 2012, they have significantly declined and this leads to better drinking water and um, quality drinking water and quality taste and odors. So another of our successes, Selby touched on a few of these. Um, the annual ministry inspection, again in um, 22s and since 2018, we achieved 100% score. Um, it's a very detailed inspection um, of water operations, water distribution, and um, other departments that are associated with water. Um, and that's why it's very uh, important for STATA and for us to have the correct data for the ministry to go through every year. Um, our drinking water quality management standard, uh, we, the annual um, audit usually comes up with no non-conformances. Um, that is regulated under the Safe Drinking Act, and we get audited every year, and it provides uh, operations with any non-conformance or opportunities for improvements. Um, and just to note that anything that is identified in the audit or inspection, um, a chance for improvement actually is good for the water system, and we're very uh, proactive in making sure that anything that's identified gets addressed. Um, staff culture. Uh, Selby touched on this also, very dedicated professionals in all fields, um, operators, maintenance, SCADA, compliance, uh, project management, support staff. Um, they all understand that water treatment and distribution is a 24 seven career. Um, and we all collectively work together to solve any problems at any time of day. Um, again, and this is to ensure the quality and quantity of drinking water is not compromised and the citizens get nothing but the best. And uh, another thing is that the staff are fully engaged in everything that we do. Um, a good example is strategic uh, planning. So we have meetings uh, where all staff get to have their input. So we, we were gonna call this, um, we were gonna call this not our successes, but we decided that these are our successes because the challenges that we have, um, Skate is the first one. You know, it's online 24 7, 365 days a year. Um, outages greater than five minutes are not acceptable. A very sophisticated, specialized SCADA system. Uh, constant changes in technology are always looked at. Uh, we have one dedicated staff, um, SCADA technician, and one shared SCADA coordinator. Um, we don't think it's a challenge. It is, we find it's an opportunity um, and a success because something that is that uh, complicated and is everything is in real time. Um, we're always open to tweak it. We're always open to make it better. Um, our technicians are very skilled and they do all the changes in-house. Sorry, okay. Dwayne, to interrupt. We've gone yep. a little bit past 20 minutes. How much longer do you think you're going to need? A um, couple more minutes, Mayor Davis. So like at least five minutes? I'll try and make it four minutes. Okay. So to be consistent, I need a motion to extend for five minutes. Moved by Councillor Sullivan. Second by Councillor uh, Sicoli. Um, any discussion? Councillor McCreary. Mayor, with the leave of the mover and seconder, I would admit it to extend for as long as it takes these folks to finish. 
Everybody okay with that? Getting sure nods. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Any discussion about that? Seeing none. We have to take the vote on it, please. Yes. Councillor Sless, how do you vote? Yes. And Councillor Hunt? Yes. yes. And Councillor Caputo? Motion carries with the required two thirds vote. You have the permission to continue, Dwight. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Um, again, it's a uh, it's a very robust system, and it's um, been, been built over the years to to be that way, and um, it's it's successful because our skated technicians are very intelligent, very hardworking, and know the system very well. Um, another success is having one water treatment plant. Um, the Grand River is our only source, and we are not connected to uh, to any other distribution systems and upstream conditions can present challenges but uh, we have we have learned to um, deal with with those issues um, we're always in touch with the GRCA and the MECP to improve upstream conditions um, we are looking at uh, furthering the capacity of the Homedale Canal um, and uh, we constantly do emergency exercises and scenarios to ensure that uh, we're fully prepared if something were to ever go wrong. Um, so again, we have very uh, experienced staff that are retiring, unfortunately. And um, the one thing we have been doing is making sure that our uh, we have two 30 plus year um, water operation employees retire in the last six months, three in the last two years, uh, two more 30 plus year employees can retire within the next few years, but we're always consistently making uh, the employees, um, new employees, especially job shadow, um, get the experience uh, from the staff that have been there a long time, um, make sure that they feel comfortable ask lots of questions um, and provide them vast amounts of training. Um, that's not only because of regulations that we do it, we also do it to make sure new employees um, get fully trained and get all the information from the staff that have been there forever. Um, costs uh, are a challenge. Um, our, our main coagulant, um, Stern Pack, has increased significantly chlorine gas across the board, chemicals have gone up, but that gives us a chance to continue to optimize the process and look for uh, alternative options. Um, equipment is the same. Um, it's vital now to know that you have to have spare parts in stock because you know two to four week delivery times are now 12, 16 weeks. Um, so until that's rectified, uh, we, we it is showing us that we have to make sure Vital parts are in stock. So treated water flows, um, the population of the city has increased, um, you know, to well over 104,000 people. Um, but we are seeing that uh, the same period of time, we've stayed quite steady in water treatment flows. Um, and this is mainly due to uh, conservation by industry and residents. Um, we maintain good quality water through flushing programs, uh, regular water quality monitoring, addressing water quality inquiries in a very timely manner. So in closing, my summary, uh, City of Brantford water system is a very complex process, um, as you can see. Um, we're very lucky to have dedicated staff to ensure process um, produces high quality um, and high quantity of drinking water from source to tap, um, and adequate funding for both operations and capital budgets uh, ensure that um, the system is well maintained and continually being improved. And I just like to say that the city of Brantford should be very proud of the water system and the employees that work for it. 
Thank you very much, Dwayne and Jim. I'll see if there are any questions. Uh, any members have any questions? So I, I do have one question for you, Dwayne. So it uh, strikes me that, you know, having had a, several tours of the water treatment plant and uh, and also the water distribution system, I think we have an excellent system, excellent staff, it's well-maintained. It's, it's a system that we shall be proud of. If I look at the risk to the system, it, am I wrong that probably the greatest risk is contamination coming through the distribution system somehow? Um, what a, what a significant risk. Distribution system as in like Jim's distribution system? Right. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying about the nature of the beast. The nature of the beast, it, it, if you think of how many um, liters of water go through the distribution system, Mayor Davis, it it's actually doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Yeah, and so what do you, you told us some of the things you're doing uh, to prevent that, but uh, is there anything further we need to do, expand on to improve that system? Well, um, putting in all new uh, pipes where there's old pipes always helps. So replacing your infrastructure where it's been in 40, 50 years, um, always new pipe is always better for the system. Um, of course, you know, like when there is a problem, uh, we, we, you know, have flushing programs. We, Jim's group continuously flushes the, the system to make sure that it's all fine. We do take uh, residual chlorine residuals whenever we flush to make sure that they're all fine. So. Last question for you. Given the high standard that we're held to for good reasons, is there anything else we should be doing or consider doing to ensure the potability of the water that's available to residents? Well, um, I, I think being in water, it's it's my job and staff's job to continuously look at threats that are coming, whether, you know, there's always new threats that the Grand River can bring. So we have to make sure that our plant's resilient enough and know what's coming to make sure in the future we're able to have those threats not matter. Okay, so oh, I see Councillor Hunt, you have a question. Yeah, so um, thank you, Dwayne, and, and to the staff um, who obviously are uh, very well trained and very good at your job. So we appreciate that. Um, my question is around capacity and the um, the the expansion of the boundary land specifically north of power line road can you i mean are we at the point where we need to consider um our our current capacity or are we going to be able to uh, manage the uh the capacity that's needed as that development uh, comes on stream um through you mr mayor um Councillor Hunt, the, the plan right now uh, is rated for 100 megaliters a day, and we're currently averaging around 34, 35. So there is a lot of capacity there. Um, we do have a project this year that is doing a 10-year um, study that is including uh, the master plan um, to give us a guideline um, when to trigger upgrades. But that'll be based on flows, on what we produce um, on average. Um, but to answer your question, no, right now we're, we're, we used to have a lot of capacity to make sure we have enough water. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Um, I only have one question with regards to the, the whole filtering process that it goes through and that we use it for our fire hydrants as well. Is, is that a requirement or is there a way of doing it where we could divert? The potable water as opposed to drinking water towards the fire hydrants. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. Um, 
to <clears throat> supply water separately for drinking and for hydro and other purposes, it can be done. Um, I, I did live in Florida for a while and that something was done at the time, uh, given that drought capacity and everything issues there. But it means we need to build a separate pipe system uh, for drinking water. And it is very expensive. It could be like 400 to uh, you know, billion dollars worth of uh, infrastructure, we need to build a separately for drinking water. Then you can have the other pipe for other uses other than drinking water. Thank you for the clarification. Sure, thank you. Councilor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do, do we have any recourse to the uh, communities upstream that, that dump and then we have to shut down uh, our intake um, and go through a whole disruption simply because they haven't upgraded the, the same uh, the same communities keep doing the same thing and, and it just seems to go on and on and on with, with 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 no remedy do we have any recourse to that um through you mr mayor um as uh, Dwayne pointed out, we are constantly in touch with the Ministry of Environment. Anytime we receive a spill call, especially when there is a repeat call, we are asking Ministry what's being done. And uh, Ministry is telling us that they, and I, I know that they do, they are working with upstream municipalities in upgrading their facilities, fixing the pipe system to make sure there is uh, no leak and things like that. So it's kind of a work in progress. Um, so that's something constantly we work with the Ministry of Environment uh, and the GRCA with the upstream municipalities. Okay, well, it just seems to be an ongoing problem. Um, we dedicate millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars to keep our facility at top rate condition, and others apparently don't and, and simply dump uh, partially treated uh, sewage and whatnot in, into the river. Uh, and, and I guess they get a they get a slap on the wrist, but nothing really happens. It, it just doesn't seem fair that, that some cities like ourselves are very responsible and others appear to be very irresponsible. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we will definitely, uh, Councillor, pass on those comments to our uh, Ministry of Environment staff. Uh, it is something we constantly in touch with and we do keep requesting them. There were uh, several awareness training we did uh, with the upstream municipalities. Um, so a lot of things have improved uh, in the last decade. They do report to us what's exactly failed so we understand the risk of, and what's the quantity or nature of the spill and things like that, and also the immediate reporting. So there are a lot of things improved, but I know it hasn't stopped, uh, but that's something we will bring up with the Ministry of Environment. Appreciate it, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Wayne, Jim. And so now I'll move to the third presentation and uh, Teresa McClanahan is here to educate us on our legal responsibilities. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Davis and members of council. Um, and thank you very much for um, inviting me today. And uh, should I have the remote or shall I just say next slide? I'm happy to do it either way. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm with the Canadian Environmental Law Association. I'm the executive director there. And we were, uh, myself and my colleagues, were the counsel for the concerned Walkerton citizens during the Walkerton inquiry and uh, participated in all phases of the Walkerton um, tragedy, which I'll describe in a moment, um, which produced 181 recommendations in two volumes. I'm also a resident of Paris um, for over 30 years. And um, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Safe Drinking Water Act and the uh, particular responsibility of municipal councillors, which is what I was invited to, to do today. And the Canadian Environmental Law Association is a legal aid funded specialty legal clinic um, by Legal Aid Ontario, just like the local legal clinic here that does poverty law. Uh, we have about a dozen specialty clinics in the system, each with a different area of law. Um, and public legal education is one of our responsibilities. And then CELA also maintains a, um, 
Foundation, which has environmental history, archives, documents, uh, and a public library. So the um, first thing I will mention is that uh, you've heard quite a bit about your system here in Brantford. Um, and so I'm going to spend my time giving you a little bit of the context about why we have the regulatory system we have, how it works, and then how your own responsibilities fit into that system. So as I mentioned, the um, system that we have in Ontario, and you've heard uh, your staff talking about a multi-barrier approach. We didn't have a multi-barrier approach before the year 2000. Uh, when the Walkerton tragedy occurred. And the Walkerton tragedy um, happened when manure that was stored quite properly at the time with what then was proper practices um, was washed into the system and the chlorinators for the system had been turned off. Um, and uh, seven people died, including an infant and thousands and thousands of people became very ill from drinking that water because that water was supplied to the community for many days before the health unit managed to figure out that it was the water. It was very uncommon for, um, it was called hamburger disease, the, the kind of illness. And so at first they were looking for a foodborne source. So after the inquiry, when Justice O'Connor looked into uh, the causal um, sequence that had occurred and then a separate um, process after that about how to prevent it from happening again, he made findings that there were many things that had gone wrong all at once. And um, that's why we now have a multi-barrier approach where, where you don't rely on just one thing. You don't rely on just a great distribution system or really strong treatment, but you have a whole bunch of things. Um, there was a lack of understanding of the risks of groundwater. It was a groundwater system, including by the oversight agencies like the Ministry of Environment and the Health Unit, for example, who testified that they didn't appreciate people could get sick from drinking uh, contaminated groundwater. Uh, in addition, there was uh, an extreme weather event, which we're getting used to. Um, as I mentioned, the chlorinators had been shut down and the operators had been grandfathered into their position and didn't understand the risks from not treating the water. They thought this was a, an excessive requirement by the Ministry of the Environment and that they could uh, get away with leaving it off. In addition, um, our witnesses for our, the citizens showed the inquiry that the geological context was a, a karst geology with a lot of uh, fractures and um, pathways through the limestone um, in addition to the original pathway uh, from the farm. So as I mentioned, um, it was a tragedy. Many people are still living with very serious illness at Walkerton, unfortunately, because of it. Um, and then at the very same time, uh, in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, there was another drinking water tragedy, and they also held an inquiry at the very same time. In fact, the two inquiry uh, judges consulted with each other, and they both recommended a multi-barrier approach. And then similarly, Kashashawan in Northern Ontario had repeated um, water crises in around the same time because of uh, pathways from sewer effluent getting into their water supply. Uh-oh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, things can go wrong with technology and uh, <laughs> even simple technology. Um, so basically, as you've already heard from the context here in Brantford, the multi-barrier approach starts with protecting the sources of water, and that is on a watershed approach. And so the questions that um, some of you were asking a few moments ago about the upstream um, municipalities demonstrate that the watershed is crucial. We can't just draw lines around our municipal boundary and take care of our own water without thinking about the whole watershed. And that's done through a source water protection um, plan uh, that the Grand River Conservation Authority helps to facilitate with all of the municipalities in question. 
And then the barriers include the treatment technology, the distribution system, maintenance, uh, water quality monitoring, and emergency response planning. And um, the point is to make sure that um, if something goes wrong, other barriers will uh, prevent uh, Brantford from having a uh, tragedy here. So the barriers are established in Ontario through a set of laws that were enacted in Ontario after the Walkerton Inquiry or actually partly simultaneously with the, with the inquiry's proceedings. And the one we'll be talking about today uh, for your own responsibilities as councillors is under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that legislation sets up um, quite a few regulations. It's quite complex. It establishes drinking water standards, which we didn't have before Walkerton. We just had guidance. So now there are legislated numerical standards for the different kinds of contaminants that could impact water. We have uh, training and certification of the analysts, operators, strict requirements around monitoring, like the numbers of samples that are taken, how often they're taken. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about financial plans and system licensing, because you will care about those things in your roles as uh, councillors. It also set up the Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Committee, which is independent of government with scientists primarily advising the Minister of the Environment to avoid um, a kind of inside the, the governmental bubble problem. They look at external threats and advise government about what they should be paying attention to. And um, then the Nutrient Management Act was also uh, passed uh, just after the, the uh, tragedy as well. And uh, in addition to local land use uh, and the relevance through the source water protection side of that, you also care about that because it also affects uh, land application of biosolids from municipal treatment plants and requirements about storage. There also were changes made to the Health Protection Promotion Act. And at the time of Walkerton, there wasn't really any legislated responsibility over drinking water safety in Ontario, other than that the medical officer of health had the ability to declare water unfit to drink. Um, so their role was enhanced and they especially have important roles around small systems that serve the public. Uh, and of course, strong roles in terms of boil water and drinking water advisories. And then, as mentioned already, the Clean Water Act established source water protection across most of the populated part of Ontario. Um, it still needs improvement. I can talk about that if you have questions. Um, but it gets us a long way ahead in terms of identifying the major threats uh, to drinking water sources and uh, how to make sure that they do not impact those drinking water sources through a variety of preventive mechanisms, including where necessary land use prohibitions. So the Safe Drinking Water Act has a purpose, and you've heard about this already tonight. It's that people of Ontario, or in your case, Brantford, are entitled to expect their drinking water to be safe. So it provides for protecting human health and preventing drinking water health hazards through controlling and regulating drinking water systems and drinking water testing. And hazard is defined in the legislation, um, and it means uh, anything that adversely affects or is likely to adversely affect the health of the users of the system, and there's further definition. And then it also can be the things that are prescribed or listed under the regulations. One of the things that Justice O'Connor looked at in the inquiry was the necessity to make sure that we have good, well-maintained, and adequately financed drinking water systems. And I want to stress that because that's an important role as council um, to look at that question. And he said that over the long term, safety depends on stable and adequate financing. So financial plans have become a prerequisite to a municipal drinking water system license and requirements were established uh, to implement those recommendations that drinking water systems be viable. 
And I'll just elaborate on that uh, for a moment. Um, they must project at least six years into the future, and they must be approved by a council resolution. Uh, the financial plans must uh, be made public and provided to municipal uh, affairs and housing. They include total revenue, expenses, projected surplus or deficit, assets and liabilities. And if there's a new system proposed, then the council must officially confirm by resolution that that system is financially viable before it can be licensed. Now, you've already heard a little bit about the fact that drinking water systems now require a license. And there are a few things that go into that license that the Brantford staff have, have mentioned and that they would have to do to renew their license from time to time. So a permit to take water out of the Grand River, a drinking water works permit about the actual system and it uh, meeting the um, requirements of drinking water systems, the financial plans that I mentioned, and proof that an accredited operating authority is responsible uh, with a verified quality management system. And you've heard about how that requires external auditing. The quality management standard was established to impose um, some rigor to how systems uh, are operated um, and sets up as, as I believe Salvi had in her, in her slides, a, a plan, do, renew kind of cycle. So you have a plan, you have process controls, you have internal auditing, documentation control. Um, you have a structure that's well understood, you know, who reports to who, uh, competencies are tracked and uh, kept up to date. Communications are well understood, particularly emergency communications, and then infrastructure is reviewed. So turning to the um, role that you have uh, is the question of the standard of care established in the Safe Drinking Water Act. And Justice O'Connor said in his recommendation 45, that given that the safety of drinking water is essential for public health, those who discharge the oversight responsibilities of the municipality should be held to a statutory standard of care. So this um, implements the part that I mentioned was a gap before that nobody had responsibility for providing safe water before Walkerton. And I've got it actually um, printed here from, from the legislation. And as was already mentioned, you being the, among the named people, uh, must exercise the level of care, diligence, and skill in respect of your municipal drinking water system that a reasonably prudent person would be expected to exercise uh, in that situation to act honestly, competently, and with integrity to ensure you're protecting the safety of the users. And as I mentioned, those listed persons include the owner of the system, every officer and director of a corporation and in a municipality, every person who oversees the accredited operating authority and exercises decision-making authority. So I thought it would be useful since you have that responsibility to understand what kinds of things tend to go wrong in Ontario drinking water systems, even with our current much more rigorous um, framework. And so the chief drinking water inspector, which was another position established after Walkerton, issues a report every year. And uh, the chief drinking water inspector in the last report noted that the four main areas of non-compliance, uh, five, I guess, uh, across the province have to do with the operation of continuous monitoring equipment, the effectiveness of treatment operations, the designation and training of the operators, the reporting of adverse water quality incidents and sampling requirements. So that's a good list if you want to ask your staff for reports from time to time uh, on these things, because these are apparently the highest areas of um, challenge for systems across the province. So what's your job? Uh, the Act says uh, you have to provide diligent oversight that a reasonably prudent person would provide, and you have to ensure the system is adequately financed as recommended by Walkerton. There is a guide put out by the Ministry of the Environment for you as counselors. 
And I believe um, Salvi advised me that you've been sent a link to that guide already. I have put in this slide uh, three things that it tells you to remember as a municipal councillor. And this is just a, an excerpt right from the guide. Uh, so the first one is that it is your duty. Um, you have that statutory standard of care. And there are legal consequences for not acting uh, as required by the standard of care. So what to do about that? The second point in the guide is to be informed, ask questions, make sure you get answers. It says you don't have to be an expert yourself in drinking water operations, but you do need to be informed about them. Uh, it tells you your decisions can have an impact on public health and to seek advice from those with expertise and act prudently on that advice. And I'll say another word about that on the next slide uh, in a moment. And three, it tells you to be vigilant. And this was um, the major lesson from Walkerton. Complacency can pose one of the greatest risks to drinking water systems. Public health units in Ontario were originally established because of drinking water concerns. And then by the time of Walkerton, public health agencies told Justice O'Connor that they spent under 1% of their time on safe drinking water. And it, it's because of complacency over the years. Um, so there are provisions for convictions. Um, I'm not aware of any having occurred vis-a-vis -vis counselors to date. There have been convictions of operators. Um, but counselors can rely in good faith on professional reports of engineers, lawyers, accountants, or persons whose professional qualifications lend credibility to the report, is the wording. And that would be a defense under Section 19. So when I mentioned that there's a good list of questions you can ask, you can then uh, take the reports um, from these professionals. And if you take their advice to heart and act prudently, then you would have a defense. So to wrap up, um, there is a multi-barrier approach legislated in Ontario. You've heard tonight from Brantford staff about the fact that that's the approach taken here in Brantford. And that oversight and the checks and balances are essential so that public can have full confidence in the safety of their tap water. And all of those laws and regulations that we've enacted uh, over the last 23 years work together to provide that confidence to the public. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Councillor Van Tilburg. Oh boy, was that ever a thorough report? And yes, I don't know very much about water. Um, but you said something that caught my attention that I was not aware of about with, regarding Walkerton. You mentioned, uh, I heard a lot of other things, but I don't, I don't recall ever hearing about the karst. Are you familiar with what the issue was with the karst? And is that an issue in our city as we currently know things? Yeah, so, so Walkerton, as I mentioned, um, was a groundwater system and you're a surface water system, first of all. Um, the lesson from that for all municipalities was that the source of water can become contaminated somehow. At that time, people didn't think that, uh, that it was a system, Walkerton was a system prone to uh, contamination. And it was only after uh, one of the expert witnesses who had done a lot of geological study of the area showed the numerous pathways through the, the car system. But how did the contaminated water get from the surface down and then into a layer that it could flow rapidly? And by the way, I might mention to plug Brantford and Brant County for a minute, um, professionals from this area lent a huge amount of um, uh, assistance, including uh, the people who did the well the well um, cameras that went down the down the well. Um, it was a lot of water out of Paris who did that. And their cameras show when you get down to a certain level, you just see the sediment that's full of manure rushing in to the well from the side. And that's coming through one of those fractures or one of those layers in, in the karst. But the pathway to get into the karst could be things like post holes, old wells, um, a, a poorly sealed drinking water it's, uh, well itself, and so on. Um, so 
municipalities all over Ontario really sat up and took notice. I told you I live in Paris. Paris rapidly shut down its shallow well, which is what was occurring here in Walkerton. Paris had an almost identical system where they were blending uh, soft water and hard water because people like me complain about their appliances wearing out with all the hot water. Um, but then they had the chlorination not happening. So there were all kinds of other things that happened for that kind of groundwater under the direct influence of surface water problem. But also surface water can have a contaminant flow. You've heard about the bypasses from upstream here. So when the ministry and all of the stakeholders looked at how we can put in um, protection for sources of water, the province came up with uh, two schemes. One is for groundwater and you have time of travel mapping for groundwater and you look at the particular geology and you look at the particular activities and you look at the particular pathways there might be in sand and gravel in the Oxford and Brant, uh, you know, sand plain or karst in Walkerton. Um, but you also look at your surface water, mm. Lake Ontario, the Grand River, the Thames River, and they have another kind of zone that they call an intake protection zone, uh, which I believe Dwayne mentioned earlier. And they look at what can get in to your canal and how fast and from where, and maybe we shouldn't put a fuel storage right on the end of the canal. Which gets to my second question, um, comes along Hardy Roads are, source water um, in Hardy Road area is also a significant amount of karst, which is why we have the area natural scientific investigation there because we have tufa rock happening out of nowhere. And so when I, when I look at that and I know all this stuff went through the OMB, if we have a problem with our water because of those developments and there's, there's probably one to two more coming along and they're gonna be significantly closer into those areas, who's responsible? So the source water protection plan, that's the first barrier and, and is the place where you look at things like what are the threats, what are the uses, what could be presenting a problem like that has to be reviewed periodically. And every time it has to be reviewed, things like the population, land use changes and so on have to be reviewed. And so you as counselors can raise questions about those kinds of issues to make sure. I'm raising a question now. <laughs> that prevention is in, implemented into the plan. And so there are a number of things in the ministry scheme that, that are mandatory for high priority threats. And then there are a number of things that are optional. And, and so you can look at, um, you know, what kinds of chemicals should be stored in this intake protection zone? Uh, should there be fuel? Should there be pesticides, et cetera? Um, can look at uh, the potential, you know, Brantford was actually one of the scenarios. I was on a bunch of the provincial committees and we looked at what if you had an accident on the bridge going over the, the Grand River on the 403 with, you know, something carrying a contaminant, how fast would that get down to, to Brantford? So you have to, you have to think about things like, like Dwayne mentioned, how fast you can shut off the system um, and so on. So those are really good questions. The source water protection plan is public. The process of reviewing it is public. Um, I'm sure you appoint members to the, uh, to the Grand River Conservation Authority as a council. Good as you can answer it. Well, so, yeah, selfie, please. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I know our our, um, our guest speaker gave all the background information, but specific to that particular development or developments happening in the Northwest area, the city has source protection plan and the plan is tied with the development applications and the planning applications. So we work with our planning department and every development application that's received, we comment on the source from source protection point of view. So it is looked at what, it, what do they store? Like, um, you know, like uh, Teresa mentioned, what is, uh, what chemicals being stored or do they, what do they have? Like a, if there is a sewage pumping station, what is the storage? Where is it going to flow? So we are um, constantly working with the planning department and all those measures are put in place and it is reviewed during the um, development application stage. So Hardy Road would have higher scrutiny than some other developments because of, of that location. 
Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, definitely yes, um, because it is our source water, we have a higher scrutiny. And the Clean Water Act or also requires that we protect in Brantford um, for downstream users, so Six Nations. So Six Nations, uh, what we call as intake protection zone three uh, is in Brantford which kind of in uh, in the east of area in Brantford. So our source protection staff look at both our needs as well as downstream needs. Anywhere there is intake protection uh, zone one or two or three identified maps or areas, we look at what's happening in that area. Um, so that happens through um, planning department and as well as our own, we look at existing businesses and developments and inspect them and look at the look for the threats and risk management plans. Thank you. Yeah, Teresa, I've got a question. <clears throat> Thinking about the, the profession I used to be involved in, law, uh, one of the things that the law study does to ensure competency is periodically they do practice audits, but on a very random basis, uh, taking lawyers chosen at random and reviewing their their uh, practice techniques to ensure they meet modern and current standards. Is there something similar in water systems? Are you required to periodically do like an outside audit, an outside mm -hmm. auditor of your system to make sure that uh, everything is running fine and you're doing everything you need to do? Yes, and, and that kind of follows the multi-barrier approach itself that um, you heard about all evening long. So that's true for qualifications of the operators. It's true for the way the system itself is operated. It's true for the documentation. It's true for maintaining that management system we described. There's, and there's external auditors that are separately verified by the Ministry of the Environment as qualified to conduct those audits that have to be undertaken in order to renew the uh, the license. Right. But I'm sure that the people who have to contend with that from right. day to day will uh, elaborate on that. So, so my question then is, so how often are those audits done? And uh, perhaps I'll be can answer. To you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the ministry does annual audits and, and it can be announced or unannounced. So the ministry can come anytime and inspect our system. And they, like Dwayne mentioned about SCADA records, that's like uh, you've heard about black box, right? Like that SCADA system is what they go through and make sure um, it kind of shows what happened in the past. There's so many parameters have to come together to show what's happening. So we have a uh, ministry doing both announced and unannounced audits of our system. And are we ever required to do any kind of a more extensive auditing process, like beyond what the Ministry of Environment does? Um, that is through the drinking water quality management system where we do internal audit and the ministry's um, external auditor comes once every three years. Again, they look at from drinking water quality point of view and they do their own audits and provide us a report. My last question is, um, perhaps Teresa, you can answer it, but so what role does our local board of health or health unit, what role does it play in respect to preserving the integrity and quality of our drinking water system? One of the most important roles is that um, if there's an adverse result, it has to go to the local medical officer of health as well as the Ministry of the Environment. And that's one of the things that went wrong in Walkerton. I don't know if you remember, but labs had been privatized at that time. And the lab that Walkerton originally used was a former ministry lab. So they kept providing the results to uh, health and environment. And then the town had just switched to a different lab who didn't understand that importance and didn't forward those results. So that's now um, mandatory. So they would get those results and then they would have the responsibility to issue a drinking water advisory or a boil water advisory. Um, in addition, um, Justice O'Connor talked about how important it is to maintain uh, constant communication between health and environment. And then, of course, as I mentioned already, they have additional responsibilities beyond the municipality's own system, um, not so much within the city of Brantford, perhaps, but for, for sure in Brant County, where there might be small systems serving the public that are not municipal systems. So, Councillor Martin, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Councillor Slats earlier touched on all the spills that happen upstream. It, it seems to be the same characters each time. 
Do we know if they face fines for the spills that occur upstream? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. Um, the ministry does look at that information, um, obviously, until uh, we're not aware of any fines in the Grand River watershed. Uh, but they did inform us that they are working with every municipality and um, they work uh, or, um, you know, look at every municipality that did the spills or a bypass and, uh, and, and look at corrective actions and uh, upgrades, whatever is needed to bring it into compliance. Okay. Is there any way to find out if they are facing fines? Because unless they're facing fines, there's no incentive for them to actually do something to fix their problems through you mr mayor uh, absolutely we can do that counselor i'd appreciate that thank you great well i'm not seeing any other uh, <clears throat> raised hands so i'd like to thank the presenters selvi Dwayne, jim and Teresa. uh thank you very much for a very educational session and even though i went through this four years and i've done various tours and talked to water treatment and distribution staff you know, on a fairly frequent basis. You actually learn something every time, giving us a better understanding of the system and Teresa in particular presentation, better understanding our responsibilities as counselors, which as you say, amounts to making sure the system is well, <clears throat> well financed, well staffed, um, and that uh, we ask lots of questions. So with that, I'm going to, well, one, we don't have any resolutions and there are no notices of motion. And our next meeting is Committee of the Hall, Tuesday at 6 p.m. So with that, I'll call tonight's meeting to an end. Thank you.